I'm with Certification Partners. We're here today with Stephen Schneider to discuss the CIW Online Improving the CIW Learning Experience. Stephen, good morning. Good morning, Lisa, and good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning, as Lisa commented, we want to be talking about CIW Online, basically how it can be used to add to uh, the CIW official curriculum. Lisa? Great. We are recording today's session just for the, the, the new people who are joining us. Um, all of our attendees are in listen-only mode. You're muted by default so that we can keep the background noise to minimum for everyone else to hear what's going on here. We are recording today's session, um, and we will post that to our website uh, later on this week, hopefully. We will also send out a copy of the slide presentation to all of our attendees, also either later on today or tomorrow, so everyone can have a copy of that. And also, we do have a special feature in the GoToWebinar service uh, called a questions tool. If you have questions for us, by all means, go ahead and type those into that tool, and we will try to monitor those and keep track of what's happening. And we will try to address your questions um, definitely by the end of the session, if not before. Stephen, uh, shall we go ahead and move on to our agenda slide here? Yeah, let's 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 move on. Okay. Uh, today, what we want to talk about, everyone, is is what CIW Online is, what it's all about, what types of resources are are available to us, and take a look at some of the implementation. Uh, particularly dealing with user roles and, and taking a look at best practices. Uh, and then we want to talk about some of the unique features of, of CIW Online, including re, uh, reporting. And probably uh, uh, one of the more common questions that we get as far as what types of reports are available to instructors. And we're going to let Lisa uh, talk us through some of the reports and, mm -hmm. and, and see what some of the most common questions are that, that comes in. So hopefully give everyone just a little bit more feedback on, on CIW Online and, and help solve some of the questions as far as what's the best way to, to actually implement. Right. Excellent. All right, Lisa, let's, let's move on. And, and uh, just for a second, just for anyone out there that's, that's new to the program or not really familiar with CIW, uh, CIW is a, a vendor-neutral skills-based certification program. We are uh, globally accepted uh, with uh, a lot of people overseas that are using the certifications in China and the UK. And uh, uh, We are vendor-neutral, meaning that we're not really working on any one particular vendor's pathway uh, towards, uh, towards knowing a particular application or, or solution. But we are skills-based, meaning that we work with uh, job skills that employers are saying are important uh, for people to be successful in the workforce. Go ahead, Lisa. Let's take a look at the next slide as well. All right. There you go. Just a toot our horn just a little bit. Internet.com even recently named CIW as one of the top development certifications. And that's, uh, we actually came in number three on that list, right in back of Microsoft uh, Developer and the, the Sun Java uh, certification, which is now Oracle. So. Falling in line with uh, Microsoft and Oracle is, is a pretty good position um, mm -hmm. for certification, especially a vendor-neutral certification. So, yeah. And, of course, if you want to know more about uh, CIW, uh, please visit us online, CIWcertified.com, and, and you can find more about the certification program and, and uh, some other things that people are saying about the individual certs. Okay, Lisa. So... Let's get started on talking about CIW Online. And CIW Online is basically our learning portal for uh, supporting the CIW courseware. It provides a way of engaging students into activities. It provides instructors to way to uh, uh, get feedback on what students are doing. Um, and it helps prepare the student for actual certification. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that all ultimately is the goal, right, Lisa? Right. Yeah, and I want to point out, too, that almost all of our CIW curriculum includes some type of access to our resources in the system. It, the, the collection of products you may have available to you in the system may depend on what you've chosen to purchase, um, but there's almost all of our curriculum offerings do include some kind of access to the system. So um, it's, you know... If you're if you're not familiar with that, be sure to ask your account manager about that. Absolutely, we we mm -hmm. want to provide support in every way that we can. 
Um, not all applications uh, for uh, resources for CIW Online would fit all, mm -hmm. all products. Right. So let's take a look, basically, at what types of pr uh, resources are available. Mm -hmm. um, Pre-assessments, movie clips, online exercises, course mastery, uh, review questions, live labs, practice exams, and reporting. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's, that's basically a shotgun list of all the different types of resources. And again, as Lisa was just saying, might not have all those resources for every single product title, but we do have mm -hmm. them for, for, for a good majority of them. Let's right. take a look, Lisa, at what a little bit deeper what some of these uh, resources cover. Online mm -hmm. exercises, this is a great tool, Lisa. This is, this is a really interactive uh, component that gets students involved in working through material making sure that they can understand the concepts of mm -hmm. a particular lesson. It, it almost has a, a game-like quality to it. I, I have to admit that, you know, as I'm working through a material in a system, I always find these to be the most fun to work with, you know, because it's almost got a game-like engaging quality to it. They do, and, and, and they are fun. Uh, one, of my most, one of my favorite ones are the Drag and Drop series, which, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, is, is very similar to matching, but um, uh, has a little bit more, like you said, a, a game feel to it. Um, I like dragging blocks around, I guess. Uh, but the exercises are a way of providing instantaneous feedback to the student. No matter mm -hmm. what type of exercise that they're in, they're going to see their responses as to whether they got it right or whether they got it wrong instantaneously. And so it, it's a way for them to basically be self-checking themselves on, on, on what they're doing, on, on mm -hmm. how, they're, how they're mastering it. Right. Right. And there's no limit on, on how many times they can go through an exercise. They can keep going through it over and over and over until they feel confident that they've mastered it. Absolutely. Movies are another resource that, that's mm -hmm. available for several of the titles. And movies are basically a way of providing a second look at some of the, some of the content that's presented in the lesson. They're not a replacement for the actual lesson out of the courseware, but they supplement the lesson, especially some of the more uh, complex uh, topics that are covered throughout the courseware, uh, movie clips are provided for them, so that they're able to go in and basically they, they have the instructor's viewpoint on it for their class, they have the courseware's viewpoint on, on, on how it's uh, printed, but it also has the visual, it has the movie of, of someone either walking through a process or talking them through a process, how to do mm -hmm. it, reinforces and demonstrates key concepts from the lesson. Right. Course Mastery. Course Mastery is a great product. This is one brand of our new. new, brand new flagship product um, that we've heard a lot of really positive response for. It's a novel take, basically, on 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 the quiz approach, or I call it. Uh, I, I was calling it yesterday in a in a session the old uh, uh, drill and kill on steroids uh, type <laughs> uh, uh, approach. <laughs> it's, it's a way it, it asks questions. You know, the, one of the best ways to learn is, is by looking at questions. Uh -huh. and, and Course Mastery does that. But there's a, there's a unique twist to it, Lisa, that, that, that's so cool. Because it asks you, once you respond to the question, it asks you for your confidence level um, as, as to what your confidence level of that particular question is, what that response uh -huh. is. And, and you have the ability to reply, I'm very sure of it, or I'm partially sure that this is the right answer. Or you know what? I'm really not sure at all. Mm -hmm. um, and and with that, there's there's educational psychology that's in back of this this application from Knowledge Factor, that basically states that you know the once you start thinking about how sure you are of your response, then the more you're actually using your long-term memory to to uh, 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 lock this into place, lock this response into place. Mm -hmm. Of course, then you're 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 graded. Uh, on this, and then uh, you give the responses to the questions, and for those responses you answered incorrectly, there's supplemental material that's put out right there. So it's a learning tool as well as a review, review tool. Excuse me. And once that's in, once that's in place, you're going to start going through these questions again in other question sets. And the reason why it's called Course Mastery is the program will claim that you're able to master content after you've successfully answered questions twice and you're absolutely confident that your response is the right answer. Mm -hmm. and so you're going to be reviewing questions as you're working through question sets, small chunks of question sets. There's only like about six or seven questions per question set. Um, and so as you go through the concepts, 
you you answer the questions, you review your in, incorrect responses, go through the supplementary material that, that's provided, and then you see that question again later on in another question set, you're more sure of yourself of the response. And basically the, the, the tool, um, the psychology in back of the tool states that this, this increases the, the speed at which you're able to learn the overall concepts. Mm -hmm. And so you're actually reducing learning time. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, we were talking about this briefly before um, as well. Uh, don't instructors have the ability to kind of monitor what their students are doing in this system as well? They have to actually go into this product and work through the material themselves, um, and then they can also review what everyone else in their group is doing. Is that correct? Am I, do I understand that correctly? They can. One of the best things for, for instructors to do is to go in and work through the, the material themselves. Um, that's, that's the best way for them to understand the resources. Instructors have the same access to all of these resources that the students do. And okay. So yes, they can go in and, and review all of these tools, work through them, and even the course mastery. Go in the course mastery, play around with it. Um, the course mastery also has an integrated tool within it that students can follow their own learning progress and see how well they've done with mastering the content, um, how much more they have to go in order to master um, all the concepts within the question set. Right. Okay. All righty. Course review questions. Course review questions. It's, it's a product that's been around uh, in our CIW Online product for quite a while. It allows students to work through questions. It, it provides review questions very similar to you know, working through quizzes or the practice exams, but um, answers ask the questions one at a time. Students are allowed to, to mark their questions and, and view their answers right away. Once they've, uh, once they've answered a question, They've got a button there to click their uh, click to check their answers to see if they've got it right or wrong. Provides them some feedback as far as where that material is located within the courseware. They're not graded. Students can work through them as much as they want. Um, and it's to me, it's a way that that students have the ability as they're going through the courseware to also be going through the review questions and help you know do a, uh, break up some of the reading and some of the lecturing with uh, you know answering questions. Uh, helps helps uh, get through some of that material. This product is is basically being phased out. It's it's uh, we're replacing that with the course mastery tool mm -hmm. because the course mastery is a lot more engaging uh, yeah. and a lot more interactive. And and like we like we said, it's it's, it's supposed to uh, uh, increase the speed at which you're able to learn the material. Right. I also want to point out too that the course review product is very similar to this to this next product, which is our practice exams. Um, they're they're closely related in a sense that both products are a collection of review tests and quizzes, um, and I, I forget the subtle differences between them. Perhaps we can have Todd chime in here to explain this, the subtlety between them. Um, well, um, one of the one of the differences in between them is that the the course review questions are really based on individual lessons. Right, so we're going that's to be it. pulling lessons direct, uh, pulling questions directly from the lessons. The right. practice exams are going to be more drilled towards the exam objectives. Right. So they're going to be they're going to be uh, segmented and 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 presented uh, based on objective exam objective levels. Right. So if a section of objectives is a relatively small section, the corresponding quiz might have a relatively smaller number of questions. Whereas in the course review product, it might always be the same number of questions, regardless of the size of the lessons. Did I state that correctly? Is my you did. You did. Okay. And yeah. the, the yeah. one 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 other item on this is that where the practice exams are specifically focused to the exam objectives, mm -hmm. and also providing a um, a much closer um, uh, experience to taking the actual certification exam. Right. Whereas the course review questions are going to to hit every aspect of the course as it goes through. Mm -hmm. um, so that they'll cover every single topic. The practice exams will focus on specifically the exam objectives. There'll be um, questions more similar to what you will see in the certification exam as well, many times having a scenario-based uh, feel and approach to them. Right. Okay. The other Thank thing the on that, Lisa, is, is, is one other reason why you know we're, we're adopting that course mastery in place to review questions is it was always a point of confusion for a long time about the, the course review questions and the practice exams mm 
Yes. And that the, the, the sole purpose of the practice exams, as Todd just mentioned, is to get the student ready to sit for the actual certification. Mm -hmm. The course review questions, on the other hand, were, were geared to help the student master content presented in the lesson. And so as Todd just stated, you know, the practice exam questions are going to be worded differently. They're going to be worded similar to the format that the students will actually see on the exam. That's, that's, that's what their goal is. For a right. long time, I, I worked with a lot of teachers who, you know, wouldn't necessarily focus on practice exams, but on review questions, thinking that would be enough to get the student ready for the certification exam, and 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 not necessarily the purpose of the review questions. Where right. The review questions are to, to help get the student through the course content. Right. Practice exams. That's the tool that we want to use to really be getting ready before we sit for our for our yeah. certification. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying the distinction between those two products. Um, like we said, we are in the process of phasing it out, but I don't want anyone to panic. We're not going to take away your course review product from you. If you've got it now, if your students are using it now, it will still be there for you for quite a while. Um, but we do encourage you to start using the course mastery. Um, everyone who is currently in the system now um, and is accessing content should have access to the course mastery product as well. Um, if you don't, contact uh, our customer service or technical support team about that, and we will look into that for you. All righty. Stephen, you want to explain what our live labs are? Live labs is a really exciting tool, Lisa. This is, this is, this is great. Uh, live labs provides a virtual environment for students to be able to go in and work on a system and complete all of the labs throughout a particular courseware. For instance, our web design specialist has the live labs option that comes with it uh, that could be added to the package. Uh, in the self-study kit, live labs is automatically packaged with it. Mm -hmm. Live labs, as I mentioned, is a virtual environment. So once a student launches live labs, a virtual environment loads, and the student is presented with a, a standard platform, Windows 7 platform, with the applications and whatever files are needed to be able to complete the labs in the courseware. They're granted a 30-hour access time to be able to complete the labs or work on any project that, for instance, an instructor might have students working on. This product, this tool, uh, is, is, is a full-blown version of Windows 7 um, and the applications that are, that are installed on it. So, for instance, if a student's working through the lab, they need to drop out to a command prompt and do something, they have the ability to do that. Um, so it, it, it's a great tool for if, if an IT department, for instance, really has a crackdown on students or students aren't able to work at home on a particular project or assignment, um, if they, they got access to the live lab, they're able to do that. Especially for remote students, if you're doing an online program and you're, and you're running this web design program, the instructor wouldn't necessarily have to worry about what type of platform are the students going to be connecting with. Mm -hmm. um, are they going to be running on Macs? Are they going to be running on Windows? What version of Windows? Uh, what version of applications are they going to be trying to do and complete the lab? You know, if they're running the live labs option, a lot of those questions are, are re, you know, taken away um, because everybody has the same platform, the same working environment, and the same uh, version of, of applications to complete the complete the lab. Right. Um, I've been in this system several times. It when you're when you're connecting to virtual machines, there's always some sort of lag uh, lag time in in responsiveness to the program. Um, and what I've been demonstrating them lately is the system is it's really just like working on working on your own own desktop or your own laptop. Mm -hmm. it's really a great tool, Lisa. Right. I agree totally. All right. I think it's time to start talking about implementing CIW online. How do we actually go about using this online system? This is, this is really a fun concept, actually. <laughs> uh, when, when a school adopts the program and, and they sign up to, to get access, Instructors are going to be provided their, their log-on access from customer service. Their accounts are going to be set up for them. They're going to be emailed their instructions for accessing CIW online, along with an access code that they can provide to their students. They, they then can have their own students log on and create their own accounts 
or the instructor can create the student accounts for them if, if they desire. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but you know, if they have the students create their their own accounts, then they provide them with the access code. Students are able to uh, log in, and then that places by them using that access code that places them into the instructor's class, so to speak. Right. Right. And I, I want to point out too to uh, uh, for some of our, our customers and potential customers out there um, that you know you might choose to be teaching you know one particular curriculum in your first semester and a different curriculum in your second semester. You might be receiving multiple access codes. Um, it is important to to make sure that your students are you know using those additional access codes when when they're ready for them. Um, you know they, uh, we're going to cover this in a little more detail later on. Um, but there, there is a lot of flexibility in your options for how you structure your codes and how you know, and, and the effects that's going to have for you, and how that's going to help you on down the road there. But before I get into that, we should also make a few comments about user roles in the system. Stephen, I know you've worked as both instructor and participant. Um, I, when, when you're working with customers, have you noticed uh, people having a hard time understanding this concept? Well, yes and no, Lisa. But it's it's basically just a matter of of understanding how your accounts basically set up a lot of times we'll have instructors that you know request a review copy of it which we're happy to do mm -hmm. and and we give them an access code they go out there create their account such as myself I went out and created my account Steven Schneider and I use the access code that uh, my sales rep sent to me I'm automatically set up as a uh, participant right. which would be the student role uh, typically yeah. And then I I say you know this is great I really like these resources they work well with my curriculum hey Mary give me a uh, I want to buy this and at that point uh, my order is placed I get set up as an instructor I receive my instructions for getting my class in and my uh, instructor access and all of a sudden I have two I have two accounts one mm -hmm. is a participant and one is an instructor and it's very easy to get the two confused. Yeah, um, because they are they are separate roles, yeah. and so that that's probably one of the most common questions that that I hear from the system is you know an instructor goes in and says hey I can't see my students, mm -hmm. let me call Lisa and say hey Lisa why can't I see my students, <laughs> um, and 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 it's a, it's very typical and yeah, and one way to do it is just by looking in the upper right hand corner when we log in, and it tells us how we're logged in, what user account we're logged in as, and what our role is instructor or participant. Right. How about that, Lisa? Absolutely, I agree with you totally. Um, uh, it is a common issue. Uh, just so you know, if you do get access to CW Online for evaluation purposes, and you're working through as a participant, and then you choose to to implement in your school, we can take your existing participant profile and upgrade you to instructor role. Um, that's something that that you know our administrative team here is is capable of doing. So, you know, make sure you communicate with your account manager when you're when you're in the process of implementing about you know what you've been doing so far so that we can accommodate those those needs and, and move on from there and that's probably the best approach and do away with uh, the duplicate uh, accounts anyway mm -hmm. yeah duplicates happen and we understand that and we're we're taking some measures to try and, and and control that but in the meantime by all means just communicate with us and let us know what's going on and and we'll work with you to make it work best you know Lisa the next probably most popular comment that I hear about CIW online is it's how's the best way to implement it? What what should I really do to get my students working through it? And and that really is about as flexible as implementing the curriculum itself. It can be done in so many different ways, Lisa. Mm -hmm. it, it it's really up to the instructor and, and how they're running how they're running their program. Mm -hmm. Some of them, you know, will will be completely instructor based and 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 want to guide the students through, you know, each particular step of it. Okay, we're doing lesson one today. I want you to view any of the exercises dealing with lesson one today. I want you to do any of the course mastery questions pertaining to this particular section today. And you know, really walk them through. Others uh, will, you know, will have students work through work through them on their own. You know, um, by Friday we want to be done with lesson one. So you know, as you go through this week, you know, view your movie clips, work through your course mastery questions, uh, or, or work with any of the online exercises. Mm -hmm. And others will even say, you know what, this course mastery product is really a cool tool. I want you to focus your time in course mastery and then use some of your other materials as supplements. 
Right. Actually, one of the approaches that, that I like and that I use when I'm teaching the classes right now, Lisa, is one of the first things that I have everyone do as we get in there is I take the pre-assessment pre test. Pre-assessment uh, is, a, is a resource that mm -hmm. basically has us go in and gives us um, a, a test, an assessment, that mirrors the actual certification exam. So for instance, if I'm taking the Internet Business Associate course, I'm going to have my students get ready for the Internet Business Associate certification exam. First thing I'm going to have them do day one, set up their account, give them their access code, make sure that they can log in and have see all the resources. Then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take the Internet Business Associate pre-assessment. Mm -hmm. What that does is it presents the students with 30 questions, and it's going to be timed, 30 minutes, and it's going to be in an environment very similar to what the actual certification environment is going to be. So right. I'm getting my students ready to take a certification test on day one. So they're starting to get used to that feeling of, hey, I'm having to take a test. Mm -hmm. And then also, the questions that they're seeing are going to be very similar to the questions they're going to be seeing on the actual certification exam. Right. I'm not expecting my students to make 100 on this exam. If they make a low grade, that's great. If they make a really high grade, I'm going to have to question whether they really need to be in this class or not. You know, because ideally, right. it, it, it's letting them know what their current level of comfort, what their current level of knowledge is about the topic, and then provides them the feedback as far as what areas they need to be working on as they go through the course. Right. It's it's a it's your baseline measurement of where you're going to be, and and you might have a, a class full of very advanced students or or even adult learners who are very familiar with this content already who can fast track their way through a course. Um, so and the, the pre-assessment test is the best way to figure those things out. I, ideally, you know, if I've got a couple of students that are making really high grades on this pre-assessment, you know, I may tell them they may just need to work on some of the practice exams uh, for a little bit, brush up on some skills, go ahead and certify, and move on to another course. Yes. Right. Then the next thing I want them to do is go in and review courseware. Now that they have an idea of, of where they're where they're working, uh, where they they need to do some work, uh, we want to review the courseware, lecture material, uh, work through the online exercise. I want them to spend a good amount of time in course mastery because course mastery is a tool that that really supplements that courseware itself and helps them master the material. At that point, you know some of my other resources actually become supplementary to to the course mastery. They can work on the exercises uh, to, to help them understand terminology or, or basic understanding of concepts, and then the videos is fill in. And once they're once they've uh, reached a good level with the mastery, let's start getting ready for certification. And we'll, at that point, which is going to be later on in my term, when we start thinking about uh, certification, then we want to start addressing some of the practice exams again. Mm -hmm because the practice exams are based on exam objectives. So if we just jump in on the first week or first month and start taking some of the quizzes, which is based on an objective, you know, questions are going to come from that entire course, wherever that objective is based. So there may be some questions from lesson one, lesson three, lesson five, wherever that objective is talked about in the course. So that's why the uh, another reason why the practice exams is something that I hold off closer to the end of my uh, class period uh, time when I'm getting students ready for certification. Right. That makes sense. All right. So you've guided your students through through all of the material. You're, you're getting close to being ready. How do you know what your students are actually doing in the system? Well, the CIDB online system provides a very effective uh, reporting tool that can help you determine uh, what your users are actually doing. Um, reporting is available to any user who has an instructor role in the system. Um, that's why it is important that we do make instructors into the instructor role. That's why, one of the reasons why we made the distinction between the, the two different user roles that are available to you. Um, and then you can determine things like, you know, how many of your users have followed instructions and have registered in the system and, and you know, executed their access codes and gotten in. Uh, how many times have they have they started working on a test? How much time have they spent on the online exercises? 
what are the grades they're earning on some of those quizzes, for example. Um, there are reports that are capable of providing all of this information to you. Um, Stephen, have you used many of the reports yourself or, or, or have not really needed to due to the nature of what you're doing? Well, given, given what I do, I don't necessarily use all of the reports that you're mentioning. And, mm -hmm. and that's why it's, it's great having you along today because I'm, I'm, I'm really going to say, you know, Lisa, tell us a little bit more <laughs> about reporting. Um, yeah. You've got some great features that I did not even think about when I was talking with uh, some teachers not too long ago right. uh, about this. And, and one of the, one of the uh, really cool things is, is how's the best way for them to, to find some of these reports? Okay. Well, you know, Stephen turns to me the, for these things because uh, uh, as an administrator in this system, I do spend quite a bit of time working with these reports and using them, getting very familiar with them. Um, so we're going to actually kind of go through and describe a few of these reports, and then I'm going to uh, bring up a browser window and actually walk through the process of generating a report to show you how it actually works. That would um, be great. Okay. Uh, one of the things I'm showing here is a very quick screen capture of the actual reporting page. Uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse moving around here, but when you've logged in as an instructor in the CIW online campus, um, your reports area, you've got a little tab up there at the top. Normally you would start on your home tab and it would list down on the left hand side all the different products that you're currently enrolled in. And then as an instructor, you'll have an additional feature there called reports. And when you click on that, you get this primary page here to start with. And you'll see there's four, set, four different steps across the top here. You're, you select your report, your user groups, your define options, and your generate reports. The number one recommendation I need to make to people is you've got this area here called sort by section or sort by list. By default, it usually appears in list order, which is just an alphabetical list. And that doesn't really provide you a lot of meaning because some of these report titles are very similar to each other but produce very different types of information. So I, I strongly recommend to everybody, the first thing you do when you hit this page is click on section in order to organize these lists of reports by different types. Um, not all of these reports are going to be meaningful to CIW instructors. Some of them are relevant to other types of content that are in use by some of our other clients. Um, some of them are just, for example, you know, there's a report here called Level of Completion by Certification. Well, we're not tracking our certification progress in this particular system. That's handled through a separate database for a variety of different reasons. So that particular report really isn't going to mean much to, to a CIW instructor. It's not going to produce any meaningful information for you. However, for example, the level of completion by asset is going to be a very important report for you to run, as are several others. So the number one thing is, you know, when you first get here, always start by section, because that's going to organize it. And you'll see that there's a group progress, which is for showing information on everybody that's in a selected user group. Individual progress would be if you need to select a specific student to run a deeper analysis on that one person, you would choose the corresponding report in the individual progress area. All right. So let me when just interject one, one, one thing on, sure. on there, if, if I may. Um, one is that's another way of telling what type of account I've logged in to CIW Online with is if mm -hmm. I have that report feature menu item actually on my navigation menu, right? Because yes, uh, if I'm logged in as a participant, I won't see that report uh, feature, Absolutely correct. correct. Yes. Uh, yes. Great. For a variety of privacy reasons, uh, participants cannot r run reports. Participants can only see their own information on a uh, page that's called the uh, uh, My Progress page. I believe it's called in the CIW uh, campus. And that is basically their transcript page. It will show them their own grades, but no one else's. So participants basically can't see anybody else's information but their own. As an instructor, you can pull reports on the people that are in your user groups only. And and as an instructor, if if I want to run an individual report, I could run that individual report, like you said, and get deeper information on on a particular particular individual, and then I could I could print that off or show them uh, during uh, during conference uh, conferences with either a student or or if, if I have a parent teacher conference in, I could I could you know uh, display some of that information specifically about an individual, right? Absolutely, yes, yes, great. All right, yeah, thanks, Lisa. All right. When using the reporting tool, it's important to understand a couple of key concepts um, uh, that, that come with the actual application that we're using here. Um, it's a little bit unclear. If you haven't worked with reporting before, the concept of a user group may be a little confusing because you can't really see it anywhere else but in reporting. But a user group is basically just a collection of users. Um, by default, when you choose to 
use CIW online, you're going to be enrolled into at least one user group, um, possibly several, depending on, on what you've requested. Um, a large school that has many different classes running, we may choose to issue you a multiple access codes that will enroll your users into a series of different user groups, for example, one per class if you've uh, indicated to us that that's what you prefer. Um, uh, at, at a very minimum, you're going to have at least one user group for your entire school um, unless you've specifically asked for more. Products, I'm going to use the word products to refer to a collection of online content in our system. In many of the reports, you are asked to select a specific product from a drop-down list. Your list of products is going to correspond to those different types of material that we that Stephen just went through the list of, the course reviews, the course mastery, the practice exams, the online exercises, the movies. Each one of those is considered a, a product in the vocabulary of CIW Online. And then assets are components within each of those products. For example, the, the practice exams will have many, many assets because each and every test in there is a single asset. Um, there are actually a variety of different types of assets. For example, the online exercises have what we call flash component assets, which are very different from the tests you might find in the practice exam product. Um, you don't really need to worry too much about the types of assets that are out there, but it will have an influence on the types of reporting that you can produce and whether or not great information is stored. So there will be times you'll be asked to uh, pick an asset from a list of assets that are within the, pro the product you've already chosen. And we'll show you an example of that in just a few moments. Some of the most useful reports for CIW instructors uh, deal with uh, information about your students and what kind of grades or performance are they producing. The visits report is a list of how many times your users have logged in and how much time they've spent in the system. If you need to analyze a specific individual, if you suspect you've got a problem student who's not doing their work, you might want to run the detailed traffic by individual report and you know, analyze just how much time they're spending. And if you see, for example, that they're only spent 20 minutes over the past you know, month, then you can say, well, you know, Joe, you're not doing your work. You need to work a little harder in order to master this material. Conversely, if you find another student that spent 20 hours over the past month and they're producing excellent grades, you can see, you can use that as an example to say, you know, this work pays off for you if you spend the time in there. The level of completion by asset for the group version is going to show you a list of all the times they've attempted tests in the practice exam product or the course review product if you're using that one as well. And it's going to show you the date of each one of those attempts. Um, because there is no limit on the number of times you can work on a CIW uh, product and how many times you can attempt a test in these products, you can keep taking these things over and over and over as often as you need to to master that. So running a report to see how many times your students are, are working on a given product or taking that test over and over again gives you a clue as to whether or not they're having a hard time mastering that material or if it's coming to them fairly easily. Um, so that's a very useful report for those purposes. Results by evaluation is going to show you a lot of the same information, but in addition, it's also going to give you the percentage score and a pass or fail grade on that particular test if that test happens to have a score for it. Quizzes in the practice exam product have scores. Review tests typically do not store a score, score permanently. And there's some, some, a variety of reasons why we structured it that way, but it is something you kind of need to, to make a note to yourself that not everything is going to have a grade that can be reported. Um, as you get more familiar with the product, you'll, you'll be more comfortable with it to, you know, and understand how to, to pick the appropriate reports for the different information you're looking for. But, but typically, Lisa, let me see if I've got this right, though. When, mm -hmm. when, when I'm in there in a particular asset or, or particular program, if, if the asset is a, a listed as a review, mm -hmm. um, it, it's not graded. Um, Correct. But if it's listed as a quiz or a test, then it is graded. Correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, that, and and that's, that's basically because the reviews allow the student, if it's marked as a review, then, then it's got that button in there that allows the student to check their own answer. So Correct. theoretically, they, be, they could be getting a, a, a score of 100 every time they take it, right? Right, yes, and therefore a, a score on that is really going to be rather meaningless. It's not really going to tell you accurate information about how they're really doing. But if I wanted to use the quizzes or a, or a test as a, as a classroom assessment, I could do that and, and yes. then go in to re, and run a report on the, 
on the uh, results by evaluation for that and, mm -hmm. and see their grades. Absolutely, yes. Great. Yes. Thanks for clarifying that. No problem. Uh, some other reports that may help you as well, um, if, for example, you are running a, a results by evaluation report and certain students aren't showing up in the list and you expect them to be there, you might be wondering, well, where is that user? There are some things you can find out about your users in general to make sure that they're in the system, they've been using it. Your access code loops with balance will show you how many uses remain on your codes. For example, if you have a student saying, I'm using this code but nothing happens, well, maybe the code has been used up, and this report will show you. Accounts generated by access code will show you the, the, a list of all the users that have, have executed the access code you've selected. Um, accounts generated within a date range will give you the same list of users, but it will show you all the different user groups that they are members of. Um, all of that can be very useful information to help you make sure that the people you're trying to report on are, in fact, in the, the places where you expect them to be and that they have the, the products that you expect them to have. That's really good for keeping up yeah. with keeping up with your product, uh, especially when you're 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 dealing with licenses like that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it is. I, I, I wasn't yeah. even familiar uh, with the capability of those reports. Yeah. That's, that's very useful information. It is. It's especially useful for these uh, larger schools that have a relatively complex implementation. They might be running many classes or have several different instructors. Um, in those situations, it becomes very important to keep track of what's going on with your access code. Before I go into the common reporting questions, our, our frequently asked questions, I want to pause my system here and bring up uh, a browser and get myself logged in here. All righty. I've gone ahead and shared my screen again. Stephen, are you seeing it? Yes, I am. Excellent. Okay. You can see that I've logged in as CIW Instructor 1, CIW 1 Instructor. It's an instructor role. I happen to be enrolled in a variety of different material here. Some of it's older material, some of it's newer material. Um, if you've not recently logged in, you may have noticed a new feature in your area on your left side menu here. We're currently on the Home tab. You may have noticed now that you've got some clusters here with a little plus sign next to it, and when you click those plus signs, you get an expansion of all these products. This clustering feature is something that we call categories, and this is something that's just been recently enabled. If you're not seeing that, for, for your own products or your students are not seeing that for their products, let us know and we'll make sure that it gets turned on for you as well. We have tried to turn this on for our, all of our active customers, but if you need that, by all means, let us know. That's really a useful way of organizing mm -hmm. the content, making, especially if you're offering several classes. Right. For example, here I've expanded the Web Foundations Associate, our flagship product. Um, I've, you know, just to verify that I'm enrolled in all this particular material here, I see that I'm looking at Internet Business Associate V1 practice exams, that's going to be one of the products I'm going to be pulling a couple of sample reports on today. So I'm going over to my Reports tab here, clicking in, I'm waiting for my page to load. Now Lisa, when I'm writing these reports, I don't have to have one of those particular courses actually open and able to run the reports, do I? No, no you do not. In fact, the process of navigating away from the home page will close any course you might have been working in at the time. All right, so my reports page is loading. As I said, it, by default, it shows our list of reports in alphabetical order. I'm going to immediately switch to section. And I want to go ahead and run an example of that results by evaluation report. So I've clicked on that report to select it. You can see over here on my right-hand side, it shows me what report I have. These titles and descriptions may not be completely precise, and for that I apologize. Um, but it is important that you just select the report you want. You're going to click on your button for step two. Step two is where we choose those user groups I was talking about earlier. First of all, you've got to choose the organization. So I'm adding that to my selected group. And I'm going to be reporting on this particular user group that I've double-checked to make sure that I'm a member of and that it's going to work. I'm going to be using my CIW eval F11 group. This is an example of some of the user groups. Um, if you're an instructor, you may see a different list. You should be seeing a very different list, but it should be according to what you have here. Step three is where I'm going to select the different options that are available for this particular report. You'll notice my left side menu is, is showing me all the options I chose in these different stages so I can see them. The options you can define in step three are always going to correspond to whatever report you selected in step one. It's always going to be different for every, for every report, and it's always going to depend on the report chosen. 
I want to run this on the practice exams because this is the grades report, essentially. It's going to give me my score information. So I've selected one of these products from the, from the practice exam, from the list of products available. I'm selecting practice exam. From the asset list here, it's a drop-down list, so I'm clicking on my little drop-down arrow here to choose that. I could choose to select all, and that would give me the entire list. This happens to be a relatively lengthy list. So I'm going to scroll down and pick just one for right now. I'm actually going to go back to that uh, Internet Business Associate self-assessment. I thought I was looking for... I'm going to scroll up just a couple of there, reinforcement exam. Come on, system. There we go. Aha. Not always the smoothest interface. We'll check one. Internet Business Associate Practice Exam. That's your basic practice exam for just this curriculum. That's the one that I really wanted there. I don't really need the self-assessment for this particular report. So I've clicked away from that box. Now that I've made one selection, I've clicked away to get my drop-down list to collapse again. It tells me one asset is selected, and now I'm going to determine a date range. So I've clicked into my date range filter. And even just so you know, almost all of our reports include some form of a date range. The individual reports may not have a date range because they're going to pull all information for the given student that you're selecting. The group reports almost all have a date range that you have to specify, um, and that's a required field. Yeah, it makes, I'm going to it, that makes it useful if you've got, uh, especially in, a, in an online course where you've, we've got people working in, at, at, different mm -hmm. pace, at a different pace yes. to the course. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Or if you've done something like you've given an assignment and say, you know, say you assign your students, say in the next two weeks you have to complete, you know, quizzes one through five. Well, at the end of your two-week period, you run it for just that two-week period to see who, in fact, did what you assigned them. So I'm choosing okay. step four here. You do have the option to output to an Excel spreadsheet so that you can save it and send it to your administrators. You can share it with anybody you need to. You can print it out. For today's presentation, I'm going to go to HTML because it's a little faster. And here comes my pop-up window for this. And yes, you do need to make sure that your pop-up windows are enabled. And here Saving comes it my... out to a spreadsheet also, if your school is using a, a, an application for grading system overall, yes. it allows you to import. That spreadsheet would allow it to be imported into yes, uh, your absolutely. school's LMS or grading system. Precisely, exactly. So, for example, here comes the report. And you can see you know, one of my first users here is one of our internal uh, staff members. Eric Barantes, and we can see here that he has attempted this IBA practice exam, um, test portal evaluation grades as of this date. We can see here that he's attempted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight attempts at this particular exam. It shows you the date of each attempt, even the time. It shows you the percentage score that's been earned so far and whether that is considered a pass or a fail on that particular exam. So, it, but. The important thing here is the reason I'm getting meaningful information is because I chose to pick an asset that I knew was storing grades. It's not a review test. It's, it's a uh, test that is, in fact, configured to store the, the questions, store the, the, the scores, and therefore it's producing meaningful information. If I had tried to run the same report on the online exercises, for example, it would not produce anything meaningful because the online exercises are not actually graded and stored permanently it would basically return no information because there's nothing to be reported. Does that make sense to you, Stephen? Yes, that does. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. And again, it's because those exercises, you know, they provide feedback to the students right away. Mm -hmm. But you can tell by writing another report, such as what you uh, had talked about at the beginning, uh, where it shows the time, you know, mm -hmm. the, the access time in there, and you can tell there and from when somebody was in doing an exercise or something like right. that, right. but not in, not in the grade report. Right. I've closed my report. Well, no, I'm going to go back and uh, very quickly kind of comment on that. He's right. Uh, your visits report here, your visits report, for example, will show you, I'm going to click on visits. I'm going to go step two. 
it's already, because I'm still working in the reports area, it's retained my settings from my previous attempt. If I had stepped away from reports, like for example, gone back to my home tab, it would not hold on to this information. You'd have to reselect it. However, in this case, it's retained it, so I'm just going to immediately move on to step three. For example, here, knowing that online exercises, about the only thing I can, can pull report information on is the amount of time spent. I'm choosing online exercises here, and I'll give it a date range, and I'll push my date back to about the first of the year. And I'll go next, and we'll output to HTML again. And here comes my pop-up window. Now, I don't know offhand, I didn't practice a run on this one before to see if this would give me meaningful information, so we'll be finding out. All right, so this is basically giving me a list of all the people who are in my user group. Remember, back here on my previous tab, I still have my eval user group, which has quite a few people in it, actually. It's giving me a list of all the people that are currently in that group and who have spent any time in the online exercises. So I have to make a little effort to kind of scroll down here to find user XYZ and see, okay, on the 24th of February, they spent six minutes. On the 6th of March, there was 18 hours. That sounds like, that's a, that's a lot of time. That was probably somebody who walked away from their computer. Um, but, you know, it is showing me the date and the amount of time spent in the system for, for those given users. So that, you know, again, example, this is an example of saying, you know, I can say, you know, you, this is where you can go to student Joe Smith and say, Joe, you're not spending enough time in the online exercises. If you spent more time, you would do a better job of mastering this material. Um, That's very good information. And so it is, mm -hmm. you, you're, you're getting a lot of information as far as even if, even if a resource is not graded, you can still mm -hmm. tell that there's activity going on. Yes. Um, and then if you re did the uh, detailed report of an individual, you'd get some of that information plus the information about uh, assessments that are great in there, and it provides an overall mm -hmm. view of, of, of what a student is doing in your class. Right, right. Lisa? That's pretty yes. good. That's yes. a lot of useful information. It is. Um, I'm sure there's probably people out there who are wondering, well, how do I know which report will produce which kinds of information, and how do I know which products correspond to which? We do have some documentation that we can provide to you that kind of shows you how to use which products with which reports. Um, and that can be provided to you if you contact our technical support department or you can contact me. Our information will be on the slideshow uh, in just a moment here. Um, I do see we are getting close to the end of the hour, too. So I'm not, I don't want to show too many more reports here. Um, I want to get back into our slide presentation real quickly here. Yeah, since, since you deal a lot with the with the LMS, Lisa, what, mm -hmm. what are your biggest types of comments? What are, uh, what types of questions are, do you hear the most about, about the system? I do. I often get referred, referred to people saying, I don't see the product that I'm trying to report on. It's not available in the product list. Um, there, there's several potential reasons why that could be. It could be the, the report you're selecting uh, it does not apply to the kind of product you want to report on. For example, you know, if you're trying to run the grade support on the online exercises, it's not going to produce anything meaningful. Um, you know, so again, marrying the correct type of report to the product that you're trying to report on is, is very important. Um, it also, there are also some technical issues on the back end that could theoretically be preventing you from getting to the information you need. If you're, you know, still think you're using the right report with the right product and you're still not getting what you need, contact our tech support department. There are things that we do to, to verify that everything has been properly associated in the system. Um, and we can take care of that for you. And with, you know, usually within just a few minutes of, and the right mouse clicks, we can get things properly set up so that you can get to them from that point. Some of the other questions that I get are, you know, there's no grades for this. My student took the, the, the reinforcement test, and there's no grade. Well, the reinforcement test does not have a grade stored with it permanently. It may show you a grade at the time that it's scored, but that information that's being shown is just temporarily stored, and then once that testing session is closed, that information is discarded because it's not configured to be saved. It's not supposed to be saved. It's a reinforcement test meant to help you practice the material and learn it not to be graded on. So again, it depends on what you're selecting. Um, or it could be that the report is not, not designed to pull that particular information as well. Some of the other questions that we see frequently. Uh, users are not showing up. I don't see my people, or the user group I think I'm supposed to be using is not there. Um, it could be that some of your users may not have followed instructions yet and have not yet registered in the system. That's when you use those reports about accounts 
and user access codes to see, you know, is everybody on, on the, the correct page? Are they using the right system? Are they getting in there? You know, first and foremost, make sure that your people are there, that you can actually see them at least in a list of users. You know, and then if you're still not seeing them, again, that, that report called account created within date range will show you what user groups they are a member of. And then the accounts by access code will tell you which access codes they use. So if they, for example, accidentally made a typo in an access code and it put them into an entirely different area, uh, you'll be able to see that and you'll be able to see, well, actually they probably would not show up in that system. Um, but you can call us to, to investigate that and see what the situation is and so that we can correct that because we can always manually move a user into the correct area that they need to be in. I was going to say, because um, what, what, what would happen if, if that were the case, and, and, and I was to, to, to see that, you know, hey, my user is not there, and, and that, but they are seeing information on their system. Right. Um, you know, if they've, they've got some courses. They actually did, like you said, apply the wrong access code. What, what do I do? Uh, contact technical support. Explain the situation. Be prepared to give the user's name or even their username if, if the user has provided that to you, and we'll look them up and reassociate them into the proper group that way. Um, and that will that should correct the problems that you can see them then from that point onwards. Great. Uh, again, great. that's an administrative feature that that our tech support group has access to. I have access to it. Our customer service team can also do that as well. Okay. Um, but they're not, not. We shouldn't just have them go ahead and create a new account and try and reapply the access code. Ideally, it would be preferred not that they not do that. We'd really prefer that they not create yet another code. Um, it, it, another account. It happens. We understand it happens. Um, but you know, ideally, you want to keep that to a minimum as much as possible. Uh, we also get people saying, you know, I'm getting a lot of information on students who are done with last year's class, but they're showing up in my current reports. Well, again, if you were issued an access code which typically has a one-year period of, of validity, you are probably using that same code for multiple classes it's going to put your users all into the same user group, including the same group that your old users have. If you want to have them into a different user group, again, it's, you need to let us know that. Even if you've already executed your access code, we can manually move them into a, a different user group if necessary. Preferably, it would be wiser to let us know well ahead of time so that we could have created that up front um, and save everybody a lot of labor and, and hassle. Um, Again, it's, it's really important that you discuss your, your plans with your account manager so that they can let, us, let our customer service team know that you know, they're going to need a separate code for, for their winter class and a separate code for their spring class, for example, um, or, or one per instructor, for example. Um, and that helps keep some segment, segmentation between your access codes and your user groups. Your access code enrolls your users into both the products and a user group. So it's important when we create those access codes for you that we know exactly what all you're going to need um, for the coming for the coming semester or the coming year that you're that you're setting up. So if I am teaching multiple sections of, of Internet Business Associate, and I've got I've got you know 20 students uh, per section. Uh, I I that's a that's a possibility for me to do is to be able yes. to have separate codes for each one. Yes. Yeah. We'll what usually. If I, what if I have uh, hey Lisa? What if I have separate instructors that are going to be teaching the same section of IBA uh, on my campus? We can do that as well. We can we can create one code per instructor or even one per instructor per class if necessary. Um, you know, we basically just take your, your order and kind of segment it up into, into the different parts um, and issue a separate code. It, for example, would include your order number and then an A, a B, a C, and so on to indicate the different segments. Okay. So basically, I just yeah. need to talk with my customer account rep and explain mm -hmm. to them how my class is being implemented on campus. Yes. Yes. And make sure that they know that. Um, ideally, at the time that you're, you're you know, making your, your purchase decisions is, is really the best time to be doing that. But we can still account for it even after the fact if necessary. Thanks. Cool. All righty. I think we're getting very close to the end of the, end of the hour here, end of the session. Um, again, we've, we've referenced the fact that you've got technical support and customer service are both resources for you. If your students are having problems with, with, you know, they've forgotten their password, they haven't been in in a month and they don't remember what they logged in as, um, we can do resets for you. Contact technical support for that. If you're getting funny messages and you're not sure that the servers are working correctly, contact technical support. Uh, certain reports are not working for you. Call technical support first. Um, customer service is there to help you make sure that you have access to the correct uh, product information, making sure that you're getting exactly what you need. They can set up your access codes and your user groups for you. Um, 
it, typically that's done at the time that, you, that an order is placed, but we can certainly you know, make modifications to, to an existing order as we go. Um, as I mentioned before, we do have documentation for, for how to use the CIW online reporting tool. I've got some, uh, a couple of different documents that explain you know, which reports are most useful for CIW and which types of products they work best on, you know, what kind of information you can expect to get with that. Um, and that can really help guide you in selecting the correct thing as you're getting familiar with that particular tool. James, we do have another, uh, James, Stephen, we do have another <laughs> webcast. I apologize. I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> we do have another webcast coming up in, in two weeks on uh, the future of our CIW development. Um, uh, you may have heard the, the news that we are working on a major update to our Web Foundations Associate. Our next webcast will cover the Site Development Associate portion of that uh, project. And there will be a lot of interesting new information in there. I've not seen any, any previews of it yet, so I don't know too much about it. Do you know any, anything more about it, James? Uh, Stephen? Stephen? <laughs> it's an I'm sorry. It's an exciting class. It really yeah. is. We're, we're moving the program up to uh, talk about uh, HTML5, uh, Cascade Style Sheets version 3, and JavaScript. A lot of hands-on interactivity within this within this program. It's 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 really an exciting course update. I'm looking forward to talking um, and, and and working with everyone uh, on the the next webcast for uh, reviewing uh, SBA. Mm -hmm. So, Todd, do we have any questions for the group? We need to address real quick. I've been answering several questions. Um, mm -hmm. There was one that I, I just wanted to state that I answered incorrectly at the very oh. beginning, um, partially incorrectly. Uh, I, I stated that the practice exams show pass-fail, and they actually do show the score. There are other items that may just show pass-fail. So the question mm -hmm. was, um, are there any plans to include testing scores in the reports instead of passed or not? Um, some some products, like Course Mastery, will show the percentage completed or the the percentage mastered, and that may be, you know, 20, 30, up to 100 percent, depending upon where the student is at that particular time. Practice exams are showing not only pass-fail, but the score, as we saw in the reports um, that Lisa was showing earlier. Mm -hmm. um, there are other products that will will show time activity, as we, sh we saw, and scoring would not be appropriate in those activities. So right. there's a variety of, of ways that we said. I said we'd look at that in the future. We will continue to look at that in, in the future to, re, to enhance those reporting um, mm -hmm. features and functionality. Right. Um, let's see. What are some of the other questions? There were some questions about the academy that um, we'll direct uh, to that. The last question was coming in. I was just in the process of responding to it. The question is, is will the student have access to the software needed to complete the labs in the CIW book? And this is in reference to the Live Labs product. The um, Live Lab product has the software already loaded in that environment, so there's um, no need for that student to purchase it. They will be using it within the Live Lab environment if the Live Labs are purchased with the curriculum as, as you order them. All of the software needed for, the, for that particular course, as well as all of the lab files that, that we, we provide either through the CIW online or Historically, we, we delivered those as a CD-ROM. All of that will be available in the live lab environment. Right. Mm -hmm. And I cool. believe that was the bulk of the questions. Yes. Ones I, that I've not really been able yeah. to respond to. I see. All right. Well, I believe we are slightly over the hour, as a matter of fact. So we will go ahead and wrap it up. We do appreciate everyone joining us today. We appreciate your attention to this, and I hope you found it useful and interesting. If you need additional support from either Stephen or myself um, or our technical support team, I've put our emails and phone numbers up on the final slide. And I want to say thank you. Stephen? Oh, I, I do. And I, I appreciate you, Lisa, for, for jumping on and, and filling in uh, James's shoes today. Oh, no uh, problem. With him and him in another meeting, uh, I think it was great uh, having your insight and expertise on mm -hmm. uh, on helping walk through some of these solutions with CIW online. I found it very infor informable and, and enjoyable in working with you. So thank oh, you, thank and, you, Stephen, and thank you for everyone for attending and 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 being a part of our session today. All right, and thank you, Todd, for for doing the backup duties. We appreciate your help as well. You bet. Glad to help. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. I'll go ahead and close our recording down and end the meeting and look for your slides coming to you later on today or tomorrow. All right. Thank you.
Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks.